Hi, I'm Rob. And I'm going to give a quick update of uh, a few different uh, open source SOC graphics projects that are um, that myself and other people are working on. Um, so going back a few years, uh, the situation on ARM and other mobile devices looked fairly bleak when it comes to graphics. You know, you had only binary drivers that you could sometimes get, sometimes not get. They're pain to work with and so on. Um, so a, I guess, getting up to almost two years ago, um, Luke started working on uh, Lima and was able to draw some triangles and some basic stuff. And that kind of kicked me and a few other people into thinking that, hey, maybe we could actually do this. Um, so I'm going to cover four, uh, four drivers that are in various states today. Um, there's Etnaviv, which is a, uh, a Gallium driver for Vivante GPU. Um, great uh, for Tegra, Lima, and uh, then the one that I'm working on uh, for Juno. Um, so the Vivante hardware, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It's, um, it's actually used on quite a lot of devices, but not too many like cell phones and that sort of stuff. Um, the bigger devices can handle GLES 3 and OpenCL. Um, it's a, and I, I should mention of the devices here that I'm covering today, two are unified shader ISA, two are non-unified, two are traditional immediate mode renderers, and two are tilers. Um, so the Vivante is a uh, traditional immediate mode renderer and uh, unified shader. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's on a handful of uh, devices. So the uh, Freescale IMX6 stuff uses it. So there's a Utilolite board, which is made by the same company that does Trim Slice. It's a little single, uh, single board computer in a little plastic case. There's a GCW0. Um, HDMI dongle thing and the uh, the Q box. Um, so it's architect architecturally fairly, <coughs> let's say, generic. I mean, it looks pretty much like a, a desktop GPU, where you have a front end that's reading a command stream built by the CPU, and uh, the uh, hardware dispatches. Uh, shader threads and, and so on. Um, so I, I mentioned it's a uh, unified shader architecture. It's um, uh, a vector-based uh, architecture. So operate, most ALU operations work on VEC4s. Um, and it's 32-bit float precision. The newer ones also have some integer support. <coughs> So basically, any newer device that supports OpenCL is going to have some, some level of integer support. Um, the, uh, the current status is there's a working Gallium driver that's able to play some games. Um, currently, it's just using FBDev backend. Uh, the guy working on it needs a little bit of help with uh, XORG DDX and a kernel driver that somehow supports DRI2. Um, but uh, it's one of the most recently started projects, let's say. And it's made a lot of progress in not very much time. So if you look here, you can see this is a quake over the course of a little bit over a month, going from something that doesn't really look much like what it's supposed to to something that's actually working pretty well. So the next, uh, next project is... Uh, Great, the driver for Tegra. Um, this is in a much, let's say, earlier stage. There's not actually a usable driver, although they're able to do some uh, command stream replay. And uh, I'd say most of the GL state is fairly well understood. Um, well, OK, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Uh, the Tegra architecture is separate vertex and fragment shader. 
Um, from a uh, shader point of view, it's fairly simplistic, but uh, they tend to get good performance through massive number of shader cores. Um, and this one's also an immediate mode render. Um, pardon? Right, right. So this, yeah, it can do GLES2, no ES3, no CL, no GL. Uh, well, I mean, you know. Um, so, but it's in uh, a handful of nice devices, like the, uh, the AC100 is a nice little device for hacking on, uh, and of course the trim slice. Um, so, the vertex shader is fairly straightforward, and this is pretty well understood um, right now. It's, um, it's VLIW with a fused VEC4 plus scalar operation, um, which actually, in some ways, makes it a little bit similar to the Adreno 200 stuff. And precision is 32-bit uh, float. Um, and as most of these I'll show like a little example, like a matrix multiply, which is a multiply plus three multiply adds, um, just to give a feel for what the, 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 the hardware looks like from the shader point of view. Um, now, this is a part where more work is needed and the kind of is where the current focus is, the, the fragment shader. I don't know if it's really like any of the desktop stuff as much as we're led to believe. It's kind of, I'm not too familiar with the really old NVIDIA desktop stuff, but um, it certainly wouldn't have been able to do any form of GLSL, because I think all of the GLSL stuff required loops. I mean, the desktop GL. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, okay. I mean, I guess there's, you can do enough things to be useful versus you can do enough things to be compliant. Um, yeah. Um, it's, instead of a single instruction stream like you'd think of for a CPU program, it's actually got three different instruction streams, at least from what we understand. Um, there's one instruction stream for varying fetch and uh, what he calls SFU, special function unit. So that's like reciprocal square root, recip square root, log to, you know, those sorts of uh, expensive operations. And then there's a texture lookup stream and a normal ALU stream. And then those get merged together by a sort of sequencing command uh, stream. So the ALU stream is a little bit interesting in that it really only has four instructions, um, MAD, MIN, MAX, and conditional select. And using those four instructions in different combinations plus register, you have some special register values for hard-coded one or zero. So you can kind of combine that in a lot of interesting ways to do a uh, few stuff. Um, and here the precision is 20, uh, floating point 20, uh, 20 bit. And like I mentioned, the current state is still fairly early resource, uh, research stage. You can do command stream capture, command stream replay, some very basic things like GL clears um, and so on. But the, the blocking point this, at this point is uh, getting a better understanding, uh, understanding of the fragment uh, shader. Um, and by the way, the order of I'm going through these is um, kind of random. It's not chronological or anything like that. Uh, so Lima is the really the first open source driver project to get started. Um, really, the focus at this point is Molly 200-600 although they've started doing a little bit of poking at the shader ISA for, for 
for Molly 600. Uh, so 200 and 400 are fairly similar. They're open GLES 2 class uh, GPU, separate uh, vertex and fragment shader. Um, Molly 400 is available with various number of uh, fragment shader cores to achieve higher performance. Um, and this one is, uh, I call a tile-based immediate mode render, as opposed to a deferred per pixel renderer. That's my understanding anyways. <laughs> um, the Molly 600 is uh, really a GLES 3 class plus OpenCL uh, class architecture. It shifts to unified shader ISA. Um, um, yeah. And uh, it's available in quite a lot of devices. So the Molly 400 was in really all of the Exynos 4 devices. Um, some uh, various all winner and other things. And the nice thing is it's a GPU that's fairly easy to get in a community board, you know, like a um, uh, Odroid or, you know, that sort of, sort of thing. Um, so the one thing, as I understand it, on the Mali 400 that's a little bit different is the CPU actually kicks off independently the uh, geometry processing and the, uh, the fragment, the pixel processing, which actually does let you do some kind of neat things like, say you're still waiting for a V blank for a render target buffer to become available, you can still kick off the vertex processing. Um, most of the other GPUs, the hardware handles a transition from the vertex to fragment. Um, so you really have to wait until V blank has happened to start doing the vertex processing. Um, so now the hard thing and part of the reason it's been taking them a lot of time on Lima is the uh, two different shader ISAs are fairly uh, strange. I don't expect you to actually be able to read that example on the bottom. But um, the vertex shader is um, fixed length VLIW, where each instruction encodes up to two ALU instructions, or two addition ALUs, two multiplication ALUs, a complex ALU, or, uh, you know, like recip, square root, that sort of stuff. Pass through, which I'll get back to in a minute attribute load, a register load, uniform temp load, and a varying or register store. So each instruction can load or store one register, but the typical, so unlike a normal CPU or GPU code, the normal mode of operation isn't register to register. Like most um, architectures, you say, okay, there's these source registers and these destination registers. Here you're really, um, kind of, uh, how do you say, routing things directly from a functional block in the core into the next instruction without necessarily passing through a register. And that uh, pass through ALU gives you like a instruction cycle hold, hold so you can keep a value around. Um, so all of that makes it a little bit interesting to write a compiler for, um, let's say. Um, the fragment shader, um, well, it's also a little bit interesting. It's also a little bit unique. Um, this one's VLIW with a variable instruction length. Um, also encoding multiple operations per instruction. Um, uh, also not necessarily, also, let's say, routing outputs from a particular you know, multiplier or adder or something like that in the previous instruction into a different unit on the next instruction. Um, yeah, and this one, the precision is 16-bit float. But uh, yeah, it's kind of an interesting architecture, or uh, ISA, let's say. Um, so the, the status so far, the focus is mainly Molly 200-400. Um, there's a uh, classic DRI Mesa driver uh, rather than a Gallium driver. 
Um, at this point, it can run basic stuff like ES2 gears, uh, GL Mark II spinning texture cube, and so on. Um, although not yet hooked up with their own compiler, mostly still DL opening uh, uh, the blob compiler. But that will come soon. And then last but not least is the uh, uh, Fredrino project for the Adreno uh, GPUs, mostly in the Qualcomm Snapdragon SOCs, but also the uh, A200 is present in the Freescale uh, IMX5. Um, so the 200 class hardware is GLAS2 class hardware at the unified shader uh, ISA. It's VLIW VEC4 plus scalar dis, uh, co dispatch. So one instruction uh, can contain both a VEC4 operation and a scalar operation. Um, the Adreno 300 is GLAS3 class plus uh, OpenCL. Um, I did forget to mention on the Molly section, I think the Molly 600 is the only one that supports full profile OpenCL. Um, the other ones don't support 64-bit types. Um, so again, the, the 300 is a unified shader ISA, which is pretty much the direction you go when you want to start adding OpenCL. Um, and it's what I call explicitly pipeline scalar. Um, so it's scalar rather than vector oriented, but the compiler has to take care to some extent of the pipelining. Um, so, and this one's uh, also what I call tile-based immediate mode renderer, but it's, uh, I guess you could say working on a macro tile. It has a, a large, well, large piece of memory between 256 and a K and a meg, uh, either on chip or within the GPU. And you can use any tile that will fit in that. So as long as your color and depth, what, uh, on the 300, which supports multiple render targets, as long as all your render targets plus your depth and stencil fit in that uh, tile buffer, uh, you're good. So you tend to use much larger tile size, like 256 by 256 instead of 16 by 16 uh, pixels. Um, but also, on the other hand, the driver explicitly handles moving stuff back into the tile buffer, then doing the rendering, and then moving stuff back out of the tile buffer to system memory. Whoops, I went the wrong way. So devices for the, uh, well, there's a lot more devices than this because there's a lot of phones and tablets and, and so on. But uh, uh, these are, well, for the 200, they're the devices I've been working with mainly. Um, so the HP touchpad and the uh, Freescale IMX5, like a quick start board. For the uh, 300, you know, Nexus 4, uh, the Inforce IFC 6410 board, which is another one of these like Odroid sort of boards, uh, and so on. Um, so I mentioned that the uh, tiling is explicitly handled by the driver. Uh, basically, the way this works is you set up per tile commands to optionally, like if you don't start with the GL clear, you need to move the old context, contents back into the tile buffer then you branch to the actual draw commands. So the, the command stream format has essentially like a branch instruction. Um, and then once you're done rendering that tile, and move it back out and then repeat for the next tile and so on. There's a, uh, so you might notice about doing this naively, you end up executing the uh, vertex shader for each tile. So the hardware actually has uh, support for a binning pass where you do one pass where you hand process all the vertices, at least, at least GL position. And then, uh, then you can handle, uh, then let's say you can consider only vertices that affect a particular tile when you're rendering that tile. Um, so the uh, 200 ISA, 
um, shader ISA, 96-bit instructions. Um, it's got some similarities to Radeon R600 in that the first part of the shader is actually all the control flow instructions, and then that has links out to the bottom part of the shader with ALU instructions. Um, interestingly, it, it only supported 32-bit float, so even if you asked for medium P precision in your fragment shader, you'd get high P. Um, so the 300 ISA is a little bit more interesting. Um, it actually supports everything you need for OpenCL, so it supports integer and float and flow, co flow control and so on. Um, I mentioned that the compiler has to deal with pipelining. So in the common case uh, for common ALU instructions, the result is available three instruction slots later. Um, so the compile with one exception. So the compiler is responsible to put in no ops if it needs to pad out or reschedule the instructions to fill in the blanks. Um, Whereas on a CPU, you end up having this kind of pipelining, but the hardware handles putting stalls in there for you, so it's not uh, visible to the compiler. Um, and status here, so we have a very recently DRM KMS driver in the upstream kernel. Um, we have Gallium support since that was merged in the upstream Mesa tree early this year, I think it was. I probably should remember that. Um, the uh, up, the mas master branch in uh, Mesa supports both A200 and A300, or let's say at least the devices that I have. Um, um, and there's also an XORG driver, um, which on I haven't mentioned it until now, but some of the older devices have a 2D core as well. So the XORG driver can utilize that for accelerating 2D operations. Um, and yeah, and both the uh, XORG and uh, Gallium driver can work either on the DRM KMS driver or on the FB dev driver from the, from the Android tree. Um, and also, if you have the DRM KMS kernel driver, then Wayland and Weston are also supported. Um, and uh, because it's a Gallium driver, we actually do have some basic support for OpenGL. It's kind of on a best effort basis. So if you ask for something that the hardware can't do or that I can't figure out how to make the hardware do, it might not work. But enough stuff works that you can get say like GNOME Shell or Xenotic or you know, any number of other GL-based uh, applications from a normal Linux distro to work. Um, obviously, it's still work to do. Um, still need to implement MSA and a few things to, uh, for, from a performance standpoint. But it's, let's say, roughly uh, fairly workable right now. And uh, finally, on the last slide, I have some links for all the different projects or where the home pages are or, and so on. So I'll upload a PDF of these slides somewhere so you can find that. Um, questions, comments? I kind of rushed through that, but I thought we would be tight on time. Okay. No? I put everyone to sleep? <laughs> All right. Well, anyways, um, like Jesse mentioned, we'll do a little demo a little bit later, and you know, you always, if you have questions, feel free to, to ask. Thanks, Rob. Much appreciated.